que en Washington, el consejero de Seguridad Nacional, Vignet Bresinski, estaba convencido de que el régimen izquierdista que gobernaba en Afganistán era una amenaza de vital importancia. Los grupos islámicos que luchaban contra los comunistas recibieron ayuda en secreto de los Estados Unidos por primera vez en julio de 1979. El presidente Carter comenzó enviándoles equipamiento de comunicaciones. Los rebeldes se denominaban a sí mismos Mujahideen, soldados de Dios. Eran en su mayoría campesinos organizados por los mulags de los pueblos y por los terratenientes. Muchas de sus armas habían sido sustraídas al régimen comunista. Los reclutas para la yihad procedentes de los campos de refugiados de Pakistán caminaron durante días a través de las montañas para unirse a la lucha. El consejero de Seguridad Nacional de los Estados Unidos, Bresinski, se desplazó hasta Pakistán para empezar a constituir la resistencia. Quería armar a los Mujahideen sin desvelar la función que desempeñaban los Estados Unidos. Además instó a los soldados de Dios a que redoblaran sus esfuerzos en la frontera afgana cercana al paso Kiber. La finalidad de esta colaboración con los pakistaníes era abrir una brecha en las fuerzas soviéticas que sangrara abundantemente durante el mayor tiempo posible. Las armas que comenzamos a proporcionarles a los Mujahideen procedían de varias fuentes. Algunas eran, por ejemplo, armas soviéticas, egipcias y chinas. Incluso conseguimos armas del gobierno comunista checoslovaco, ya que obviamente estaba dispuesto a recibir incentivos materiales. Y llegó un punto en el que comenzamos a comprar armas para los soldados de Dios al ejército soviético de Afganistán, puesto que cada vez era más corrupto. We probably exaggerate their influence in many cases, but most important of all, they operate overtly. Anybody who wants to know what the Council of Foreign Relations does can very easily find out. And once that person finds out, they'll probably discover that it really doesn't run the world, but often makes very useful recommendations. For example, you know, we're all confronting the problem of Iran. Well, I don't know, maybe this will reinforce the conspiracy theories, but two years ago, I co-directed a study on U.S. policy towards Iran for the Council on Foreign Relations. I think still a very good study. I said I co-directed. Who was the other co-chairman? Robert Gates, currently the Secretary of Defense. Now, on the one hand, maybe that reinforces the conspiracy theory that somehow or other <laughs> we're pulling the strings from behind the scene. But alternatively, maybe it tells you something, namely that this is an open process. Anyone can get those recommendations, read them, know who they are, can assess them whether they stand the test of time or not. I think that's all to the good.
born in Poland in 1928, and as the son of a very active diplomat, the equally adventurous young Zbigniew Brzezinski was soon on the road exploring the globe. His own plans to study for a career in the Canadian diplomatic service fell through, but fate had greater plans for him, as Brzezinski graduated from Harvard in the USA and soon found himself in the thick of international affairs, walking the corridors of power and witnessing history being made. The communist worlds of the Soviet Union and China held a particular fascination for him, and his incisive strategies for handling their evolution made him a respected advisor to a string of American presidents. Brzezinski's particularly close relationship with Jimmy Carter as his national security advisor in the late 1970s also made him one of the most influential people in the Western Hemisphere. It's a respect he still carries to this day as he regularly revisits a very different world. I think I gather your family has Polish nobility. Well, you know, in Poland, the nobility was a very widespread term. <laughs> so how vindicated do you feel uh, when the Soviet Union did finally collapse? And it was very much based on a lot of the theories that you had put forward. Well, by then, of course, I've had the second tour in the government where I could apply my notions much more directly and much more authoritatively for four years. Um, and I think, actually, that was a time when we really began to exploit these weaknesses significantly and what we started was then followed by President Reagan and then President Bush so when the final crunch came yes it was a sense of personal vindication but much more importantly than the personal vindication it was a sense of historical vindication and behind it all of course intellectual well, as National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter in, in the late 70s, you were pretty much the right-hand man to the most powerful man in the world. And while that was happening, it was the thick, you were in the thick of major global events, uh, normalization of ties with the People's Republic of China, at the cost of Taiwan, I guess, the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt, there was the realignment of Iran from friend to enemy and the Iranian hostage crisis, there was the financing of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the uh, Panama Canal Treaty, the signing of the SALT II Treaty. Was there a sense of everything happening at once? At that time? Yes, it was overwhelming. But I imagine that was also probably true in the case of other presidents. Just one doesn't sense until one gets into the White House the enormous pressure of events and how these different issues, even if they are not reaching the point of maturation, place demands on your time all the time. So you're in effect racing from issue to issue, from issue to issue, all the time. And you've just read a list that illustrates it. And I had my hand in all of these, although in some of them, in a secondary or tertiary fashion, in one or two of them as a sort of next to the president, the primary player. Now, I gather you even got a little bit of criticism after the 9-11 attacks in 2001 because uh, people were saying, well, you formed the Mujahideen network and that then became Al-Qaeda through the Taliban and so on. Well, the Mujahideen came to its own because the Soviets attacked the country and the Afghans decided to resist. But the United States decided to help them, and I was involved in that. But so did a lot of other countries. And let me just mention it to you a few. Britain, Egypt, um, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, China, uh, and under Reagan the effort was greatly increased. So it was in a sense an international response to what was rightly considered to be very much going beyond the limits of what is acceptable even in the course of the Cold War. After Harvard, where'd you go? After Harvard? Well, at, after I got my degree at Harvard, I taught at Harvard. I taught at Harvard from 1960. Then in 1960, I went to Columbia University and have been a professor there since then. But periodically, I have been involved in public affairs. So for example, in the mid-60s, I was on the Policy Planning Council of the Department of State. In 1960, I was marginally involved in the Kennedy Campaign for President Foreign Policy Brain Trust. In 1968, I directed the Foreign Policy Task Forces for Vice President Humphrey when he was running for the presidency. In 1972, I became director of the Trilateral Commission, an American, Japanese, West European public organization. In 1976, I directed the Foreign Policy Task Forces for Jimmy Carter. Then I became his National Security Advisor for four years. Then I went back to private life, although in 1988, I was co-chairman with Ben Scowcroft and Henry Kissinger of the Foreign Policy Task Force for Vice President Bush. You mentioned something earlier that you've done that 
comes up right in the spot that you're sitting <clears throat> many times by our callers across the country. And that is a suspicion that there is a conspiracy afoot through the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations. You ran the Trilateral Commission for how long? About three years, I think. Something like that, three years. Not only did I run it, I helped to found it and organize it with David Rockefeller. So if any of our viewers are conspiracy-minded, here is one of the conspirators. Let's talk about it for just a moment. How big is it? How many people physically belong to the Trilateral Commission? When we first started it, and let me repeat again so the viewers will know what we're talking about. It's an American, North American, Western European, Japanese organization to promote closer contacts between these three regions of the world. And the commission is composed of private citizens, not government officials, uh, who are leaders in the different sectors of society. So when we first started, we sought a commission of about 60 people. And initially, when I was first helping to organize it, we had a hard time recruiting those 60 people because it was a brand new idea, which the two of us had thought of, and Rockefeller and I. And now we have 360 people with an enormous waiting list. It's been an eminently successful operation, obviously filling a major need for a community of dialogue and cooperation between these three regions. We are incidentally the ones who proposed originally the holding of the annual summit meeting of the industrial democracies. That was an idea that originated with us in the Trilateral Commission. Seven Nation yeah. Economic Summit. Yeah. <clears throat> How do you become a member? You become a member by invitation issued by the respective executive committees of the commission. The commission is 360 mem members, a smaller executive committee. The executive committee has its own regional sort of identity. So if you want to be a member of the American one, the North American Executive Committee has to invite you. I say North American because this is both a Canadian and a U.S. activity. Is there any reason for the audience to think um, that this is a bad organization that conspires to, and, and I want to make sure I represent what they say, is that this, this group really guides the foreign policy of this country. Well, you know, I can, I can tell you even better what this group uh, represents, what people think this group represents, people who are conspiratorially minded, because I encounter that all the time uh, when I speak around the country, and uh, the kooks that, you know, pop up with this theory come either from the extreme loony left-wing or the loony right-wing perspective. If it's a loony right-winger, he'll stand up and say, you're a conspiracy of people who want to impose one world government and deprive us of our sovereignty. And if it's an extremely loony left-winger, he'll stand up and say, you're a conspiracy of rich capitalists who want to control the world for the sake of global profits. And that crazy outfit, La Rouge, started with the left and swung to the right, for example, over the last 15 years. Um, but the answer is, look, the commission operates openly. There's nothing secret about it. It is a group of influential people. We don't hide that in the country. We deliberately want influential people. This was a big thing for them in the last two years to shift from denying they were setting up a world government for the last 50 as they were setting it up. Thousands of their internal documents fell into our hands. They published many of them in scholarly reports knowing you wouldn't be reading them. That's how arrogant they are. Thinking all you care about is you know, baseball and football and partying. Well, Brzezinski explains why, and I'm seeing this in more and more reports, why they've now, and of course I said this years ago, in the last two years they've shifted from denying all of this to admitting that it's real because they've passed that cost-benefit point where if we lie about world government, that'll discredit us with people that find out we are setting it up, but they're such a small minority, we want to sneak up on the world population with this global corporate takeover, so we're going to go ahead and lie. But in the last two years, and I think a few years late, they should have done this a decade ago, they were smart, they went from denying it to admitting it, and even admitting that it's authoritarian. Remember two years ago, or about a year and a half ago, it's in the Obama deception, uh, scores of articles, Time Magazine, Newsweek, but especially the Financial Times of London said, and now for world government. That was the headline, and now for world government. And why did they say, and now for world government? Well, he goes on to say, we built it quietly, we built it in stealth, yes, it's authoritarian, you don't know what's good for you, this is to save the earth. And yes, the Bilderberg Group's real. Okay. 
So not only do they admit it's a world government, but that it's unelected and unaccountable to you because they know better. And then, of course, in every case, they rob you with this system they've built. And torture and secret arrest and DNA databases is what these people put in to place in every country they control. They are tyrants. They don't want free speech. They don't want private property for the general public, only for themselves. It's all selectively enforced. It's a super elite destroying anybody who has two cents to rub together. Now, you have all that going on. And you have Zbigniew Brzezinski at a televised CFR meeting admitting there's been a global awakening to the new world order. The G20 is our best shot at world government, but it's infighting. And we already played that part of the clip. It's a long clip last hour. The full unedited clip is up on Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com right now. But then the first question he gets is, you know, don't we need to use the UN as a world government? And he goes on to explain that it's basically impotent, that yes, they want a world government, but there's no single power big enough to enforce the world government. So he also admits the U.S. is the main bulldog and the main engine of the world government, destroying our sovereignty while we're used to destroy other people's sovereignty with economic warfare, with invasions, uh, selling rebels' weapons. Uh, selling neighboring countries weapons, uh, State Department Memorandum 200, where Kissinger talks about selling weapons to a neighboring country to attack the next country to create population reduction. I mean, this is ruthless. And this is the great game where they play nations and groups and people off against each other. That's what racist films like Machete are about, getting us all fighting with each other. Because if the globalists can't make us infight, they're going to lose. But his big admission is the people are now awake. As I said two years ago, they made a, 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 a decision that wasn't announced, but you can see the decision. Suddenly, hundreds of articles a week admitting it's authoritarian world government, but that it's for your own good. Remember that. For the world government and telling you it's good. And yes, they've been trying to set it up. And poor them, they're having trouble because people are awake. Clearly, they passed that point where lying about it was only discrediting them. So now they shifted into telling you, okay, world government is a good thing. But they still think cops are dumber than the general public because they still teach police in all their training manuals that it doesn't exist. And that if you talk about it, the person talking about world government wants to kill cops. It's just very elementary brainwashing. Hey, if you hear somebody saying there's a banking takeover, a world government, be careful, they want to kill you. That's in the, all the different ADL, Southern Poverty Law Center, MIAC, Homeland Security reports that we received from law enforcement a year and a half ago. Now, that's all public. See? The other major change in international affairs is that for the first time in all of human history, Mankind is politically awakened. That's a total new reality. Total new reality. It has not been so for most of human history until the last 100 years. And in the course of the last 100 years, the whole world has become politically awakened. And no matter where you go, politics is a matter of social engagement. And most people know what is generally going on, generally going on in the world and are consciously aware of global iniquities, inequalities, lack of respect, exploitation. Mankind is now politically awakened and stirring. The combination of the two, a diversified global leadership, politically awakened masses, makes a much more difficult context for any major power, including currently the leading world power, the United States. I really enjoyed your presentation, but I'm wondering how would you rate the United Nations and uh, helping solve some of the geopolitical problems we've had? Some people say they're, you know, they're not adding a lot of solutions, and, and some people even suggest we should have another organization internationally that can do the job that the United Nations should be doing. And even people are talking about one world governments. I mean, uh, how, how do you view the UN right now? Well, you know, there should be such an organization. The word should implies that there is a kind of uh, moral imperative or need for it. But it doesn't exist. Why doesn't it exist? Because we don't have a situation in which there is a concentrated source of power that has universal reach. Not even America has that. 
So the United Nations functions well in areas in which it is possible to generate consensus. And that deals usually with elements pertaining to human suffering, or to well-being, or to health, for example, the food organization, the health organization, the relief agencies, or arbitration of okay. conflicts of... And basically earlier he talked about the G20 is the best mode they've got for the world government. And imagine how outrageous this is. Private central banks that have engineered the financial collapse on record, that's now public knowledge, are saying we're going to form a world government that issues a magic digital currency that you've got to buy from us with interest backed up by real assets. I mean, why not just go pick some wino off the street corner and make them God? And, uh, you know, put their face on some money. And, and, and then we have to pay them interest to have it. Think about that. And that's why if we point out that they're illegitimate, autocratic, authoritarian, and that it's immoral what they're doing, then there's no way they can put this into place. And that's why they're so scared. And that's why they're going, okay, there is a world government. You know, we're trying to set it up for your own good. It's God's work. It's a moral imperative. A moral imperative. This is a guy who brags about how he funded in the uh, later administration of Jimmy Carter the, the operations with Pol Pot that killed 30% of the population conservatively. These guys are in to what they do. These are eugenicists at every level who want you dead. They don't just want your property, they want you and your kids off of it. Skulls out there on the back 40. And that's the next level of awakening. The public is now awoken to the fact there is a world government run by banks. The public had better wake up fast to the fact that this world government is murderous and that they compete with each other in the power structure, in the pyramidal system, for who is the most cunning, the most ruthless. They believe in social Darwinism, survival of the fittest. They believe whatever they do to murder and kill and steal and poison is a moral reflection of their sickening humanism, their form of humanism. Now, here's a David Rockefeller quote. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national autodetermination practice in past centuries. Here's another one from his uh, book, Memoirs, published five years ago. For more than a century, ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wailed over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal, well we know you are, working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalist and conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political economic structure. One world, if you will. If that is the charge, I stand guilty and proud of it.
This very same network used BCCI to fund the Afghani rebels. The deputy director of the CIA, Richard Kerr, said late today that the CIA did use the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, BCCI, to support CIA activities overseas. Most people still believe that the Soviets had maliciously invaded Afghanistan in order to spread their communist agenda. The Al-Qaeda was essentially a kind of in, a byproduct of Brzezinski's campaign to embarrass the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They, they weren't in Afghanistan at that time. Brzezinski boasted later that he was uh, responsible for drawing them into Afghanistan. He did this extraordinary interview with uh, Le Nouvel Observateur in France, and they said, but aren't you worried that you've uh, created this whole new force of uh, Al-Qaeda? And he said, oh, what's more important, a few crazed Islamists or the fall of the Berlin Wall? And uh, they said, but you know, is there no danger? Isn't, aren't they dangerous? And he said, nonsense. He said all this in 1998. Uh, so uh, I consider, I knew Brzezinski and, and, at McGill University. We were students together and took very small classes together. And in some ways he's bright and in some ways he's kind of nuts. And um, he's, he had the kind of nuttiness that uh, made him attractive to the Rockefellers. Bin Laden and his network were actually funded by BCCI through U.S. covert operations. You have served on the board of the Council on Foreign Relations. You started, helped start the Trilateral Commission, and you've been to the Bilderberg Group. In any political system, there are sort of over-the-table and under-the-table arrangements. Arrangements that involve ruthless, illegal, and immoral activities in order to dominate humanity. Mucho se sabe de la participación de los Estados Unidos en la creación de algunos grupos como por ejemplo Al Qaeda, que ahora se empeña en, entre comillas, perseguir eh, por su actuación. Pero claro, nada se dice sobre esos comienzos, quién financió, quién entrenó incluso a los miembros de Al Qaeda. Bueno, un ejemplo más de Estados Unidos y su doble moral. Hillary Clinton dio una entrevista a la cadena Fox News y habla sin ningún tipo de vergüenza con la relación. Tiene subtítulos, por supuesto, la, la entrevista está en inglés. Presten atención a la forma en que confiesa que ellos crearon Al Qaeda. Um, you, so if you think if we walked away from this, didn't give them money today, it would be worse for us from a security standpoint? I do. I do. We're building a relationship that just did not exist. I said in our last trip when you were with me that we had a huge trust deficit, in part because the United States had, to be, to be fair, we had helped to create the problem we're now fighting. How? Because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. The Soviets left Afghanistan and then we said, great, goodbye, leaving these trained people who were fanatical in Afghanistan and Pakistan, leaving them well armed, creating a mess, frankly, that uh, at the time, we didn't really recognize. We were just so happy to see the Soviet Union fall, and we thought, okay, fine, we're, we're okay now. Everything's going to be so much better. Now you look back, the people we're fighting today, we were supporting in the fight against the Soviets. ¿Qué tal? Bueno, ahí lo tienen clarito. Nosotras, nosotros somos los responsables, los que creamos, los que entrenamos, y bueno, pensábamos que todo estaba bien. Vieron cómo les conviene. A veces son amigos, a veces son enemigos. Now in the real world, or should I say our world, because that is a highly subjective term. We do know that those who consider themselves to be our ruling elite do fear more than anything else that one day we will wake up. Let's hear it in their own words. The second could threaten our global preponderance.
our global strategic preponderance. First proposition. I'm deeply troubled that a very vague, emotionally stated, semi-theologically defined diagnosis on the central global menace is obscuring our national ability to comprehend the historically unprecedented challenge which is being posed in our time by a massive global political awakening and thus is obstructing our ability to deal effectively with the global political turmoil that this awakening is generating.